All right, uh, let's start. Thank you for having me, of course. So my talk is going to be about data visualization and storytelling, and I'm going to start out by telling you a little bit about me. So my name is Marisha. I'm a data scientist and data science educator at GoData Driven, now called Xibia Data, which is a company in the Netherlands. And I am also organizer of the Amsterdam chapter of PyData. We're organizing a conference in September. You're welcome to join. And besides that, I also consider myself a hobbyist storyteller. So I like telling stories, whether that's on stage or through writing. I just like stories, basically. And I used to think that this was a very different thing from my day-to-day -day work as a data scientist, as a programmer. Um, but I learned that that may not be the case. And that's also what brings me here to you today. Because data visualization, uh, something that's very common in my day-to-day -day work, can also be a form of storytelling. And that's what I'll talk to you about today. Before we start, I want to go over what this talk will not be about before we get into what this talk will be about. First of all, uh, this is not going to be about data visualization for data analysis, you know, the type of data visualization that you do uh, to get insights from your data and um, insights from your data set before you do any modeling. Uh, you probably got that covered. It's also not going to be about what the best plotting library is. Uh, there are, of course, many different plotting libraries out there. I, I'm not going to say which is the best or which is the one that I use the most. Uh, for this talk, I did everything in matplotlib, but that was just to, to show you these examples. Um, it will be about data visualizations as a whole and not any specific tooling. So what it will be about is uh, that, first of all, I'm going to try to convince you that data visualizations can tell a story. And second of all, um, I'm going to show you some simple steps and simple tricks of how you can adjust your visualizations to tell the story that you want to tell. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Why do we bother visualizing data even to begin with? Some people are under the impression that visualizations are just pretty charts, just colors, you know, but all of the important information that you need about your data can kind of, you can kind of get through those through statistical analysis. Well, that's not the case. Uh, summary statistics are not enough to describe the data. Uh, and an effective tool to demonstrate that is actually Anscom Quartet. And it is a set of data sets, as you can see here, four different data sets that produce the exact same summary statistics. That means the mean, median, um, uh, standard deviation, correlation, which could lead you to believe that these data sets are identical. Whereas if you visualize them, as you can see, they're very different. And that also means that if you have a data set like this, for instance, with an X and a Y and some values, of course, the first thing you're going to do is get some of these summary statistics. But this doesn't tell you the whole story about the data. Does it add any value to plot the data? Well, in this case, definitely. Because if you actually plot the data, you'll see that this data set represented a dinosaur. And this is a visualization created by Albert Cairo. And or in order to urge you to never just trust summary statistics alone and always visualize your data. And this was taken one step further with the article Same Stats and Different Graphs, where the authors created 13 different data sets with the exact same summary statistics as the dinosaur that we just saw. So that means the mean of the x and the y, the standard deviation, uh, the, course, the correlation. But as you can see, those data sets are very different in appearance. So visualization matters, but you probably know that already. You probably have also made some visualizations in the past yourself. And the question you may have is, what does this have to do with data storytelling? Well, first of all, there are different types of visualizations. We have a data visualization like this one, a simple matlab plot, plot, a simple scatter plot, and it is just of a few data points and probably gives you some insight into the data you have at hand, just like the plot of the dinosaur did. Um, and this is meant for analysis, but this is a very different visualization than a visualization like this one. This is also a data visualization, and this is a chart that was created to visualize the death toll of a uh, uh, the number of deaths per month in Iraq from 2004 until the withdrawal of the US troops in 2011. 
And whereas the one, the scatter plot here is simply meant for data analysis, you can clearly see that the other graph here is created in such a way to incite an emotion. You don't even have to see the numbers that are on the chart, but just through the use of colors, the title, the orientation of the bars, you pretty much get an idea of what this data is about, right? And just as easily, you can also flip that message. Again, without reading the numbers, the numbers are exactly the same, just by changing those things, the title, the colors, the orientation of the bars, the message and the first impression that you get from a graph like this is completely different. So the way that the data was presented to you also guides you to a very different conclusion about the data. And that brings us to the two different types of data visualization that I concern myself with, which is exploratory and explanatory data visualization. So the first chart we saw, the Mudplot-Lib plot, was a perfect example of exploratory data visualization. This is what we do if we, as individuals, as data scientists, data analysts, are looking to uncover the secrets that are hidden within our data. If we just create some visualizations to get better insights, to know what's going on there, to maybe if we form a hypothesis and we want to verify that with the data that we have, we use an exp uh, exploratory visualization to get those insights. But the second type of visualization that I concern myself with is called an explanatory visualization. And this is the visualization that I make when I want to communicate an insight that I found through exploratory data visualization to someone else. So exploratory visualization is just for myself. Explanatory visualization is something that I use to communicate. And it doesn't have to be a fancy infographic like the one that we saw before. But where exploratory visualization is experiment-driven and it changes a lot, and it doesn't really require a clear conclusion, explanatory data visualization does guide the reader or the viewer to a certain point, to a certain conclusion that you want them to draw from the image. And that also means that the best exploratory visualization is not necessarily the best explanatory visualization. When you're exploring your data, you have this luxury of time. You can look at summary statistics, of course, but you can also create different visualizations inspired by one you made before. And you can spend time dissecting the visualization that you made to see what's going on there and make a connection to insights that you made before. However, when you're communicating your insights, you do not have that luxury of time. You, if you're presenting uh, to a stakeholder, for instance, you want them to know what you're talking about and why you're talking about that immediately from the get-go. You don't want to stand there and point at all the different things in your visualizations and explain what's going on there for them to understand what's going on as well. It should be immediately uh, clear. And most likely, you're also presenting something to for a certain reason. Maybe it's to incite a discussion, maybe it's to convince someone of a point. It's never just to convince them that you've done some work. So explanatory visualizations tell a story. Uh, for instance, maybe your analysis reveals that uh, changes to the marketing campaign have made people look more favorably at your company, therefore you recommend continuing with this or you've discovered that certain chickens grow better on a certain diet, therefore you recommend continuing with that di diet. Explanatory visualizations aren't just there to be pretty in your PowerPoint, they are there to support a point, and because the data is only valuable if given context. And while data may be objective, every decision that you make in how you present the data in your visualization shapes a different story. So, if we look at this chart, for example, it shows population growth over time, over the last 60 years. And we can see there's quite a bit of growth going on there. And it maybe looks a bit worrying, for instance. But when you compare it to this one, it actually looks critical. Both line charts are from the exact same data set, but a tiny decision, like where the amount of years that you display as reference, have a huge impact on the story that the chart itself tells. And our role as data storytellers is to 
bridge the gap between the clinical and analytical data into a thought-provoking story that still stays true to the original data. So how can you tell a good story with your data, with your visualization? Like I said, I'm a hobbyist storyteller, and when we talk about storytelling and we think about our stories, there are usually three main parts, and that's not just the beginning, the middle, or the end. It is the context where the story takes place, it is the people or the characters in the story, and it is their motivation or purpose. And of course, our data story doesn't have people, places, or purposes. We still have some key points to reference to. So these are the three Fs of data storytelling. First of all, the foundation of the visualization. And this is the way that you choose to display the data itself, the bare bones of data storytelling. How do you choose the right location and chart? Then we have the focus. And these are about the characteristics that you can add to your chart that will help draw the attention of the reader to where you want their focus to be. What can you add that helps you tell your story? And lastly, forward. What do you want people that see your visualization to take away from the visualization? How do you want them to continue? What is this call to action? Why are you showing them this? What is their takeaway? And these are also the points that I'll be focusing on for the remainder of this talk, starting, of course, with the foundation. As you know, there are lots of different types of charts. There's line plots, scatter plots, bar charts, pie charts, lots of different types of charts. But some are more appropriate for under certain circumstances than others are. Let's take a look, at, for example, at these uh, two graphs. They both represent the exact same data and the exact same uh, numbers, the total number of participants and the total number of trainings offered during a year. But which of these is better at showing the trend? How the numbers change throughout the year? Is that option A, the line chart, or is that option B, the bar chart? I would argue that in this case, just if we're looking for the trend, then option A is a little bit clearer. Um, which doesn't mean that the bar chart is bad necessarily. A bar chart like this is very good if you want to compare the numbers between the different years. But if you're looking for the trend, option A is the better choice. And the same goes for these two charts. Again, exact same numbers, uh, exact same data source. But which visualization makes it easier to determine which investment has a greater share? I would say personally, at first glance, the second option, it makes it clear that the uh, international stock has a bigger share, even though the bars are quite uh, close to each other. In the first option, blue and orange look the exact same size, and in the second option, it's a little bit easier to compare the two and see, especially because they are ordered, that the first bar is bigger. Something that would have made this even more easy to see if is, is if we added a grid to the background, so you can very easily compare the sizes of the bars there. So how do you determine what the right chart is to use for your use case? Well, I found two things that really help. And the first of all, honestly, is just a bit of experimentation. So a bit of experimentation and common sense. Um, of course, you wouldn't try to display categories in a scatterplot, for instance, but you can try out different visualization types and see which one uh, conveys your point or the thing that you want people to look at more clearly. Uh, if you have a specific insight in mind that you want to share, you can just make a couple and see which one works better. And the second thing that I found is that this chart guide also really helps because certain types of charts are simply better for certain types of data and you don't always have to reinvent the wheel yourself. Uh, this is a guide from chartguide.com, which is an amazing poster that gives an overview of what charts work well for your data types. And this is only a fraction of it because I couldn't fit the whole poster on the slide that just wouldn't fit, but I wholeheartedly recommend it. However, the foundation isn't just about what chart do I use. There's a couple of things that you also have to take in mind. And the first of, one, first of all is make sure that the reader is familiar with your type of chart. For instance, charts with labels and confidence intervals are not necessarily your friends when it comes to explanatory data analysis. They're great, I get it, I love them. Confidence intervals really help you understand your data a lot better and give a general idea of how precise a measurement is. 
but it won't really help the reader understand the data. So a chart like this, for instance, uh, takes these box plots. Sure, it does give you a lot of information. It tells you a lot in terms of attack score for each Pokemon. We don't just know the average. We also get a feeling for the consistency within that group. But there's a lot going on here. And whereas as in an exploratory phase, you have the luxury of just taking your time to analyze this chart. When you present it to a person um, and you want to make a point, you want to make that point immediately. And a box plot isn't that common outside of exploratory data analysis as you might think. So before you show them this, you probably are going to have to show them this, where you have to explain that the interquartile range is calculated by determining the upper and lower quantile, and then what the interquartile range is used to determine the whisker and upper whisker, um, and Q1 and Q2, and just this isn't going to make your stakeholder very happy, of course. And the second I want you to take in mind is, or consider, is choose the data to display carefully. So we've already seen this example where, uh, with population growth, where the range of years chosen has a huge impact on the emotion that the chart incites. It might seem obvious, but limits for ranges can drastically change the story. And the same actually also goes for units. So all of these three graphs are based on the same data. In the first graph, we show the difference between sales for store A and store B. And it seems like store A is doing a lot better. But notice that the limits on this graph don't actually start at zero. And if we do change them to zero, the results look a lot closer. And then again, if we change the units that we're using, we change them to percentages, it might make a lot of sense to set the ranges to zero to 100, because those are you know, the percentage ranges. And again, the results for store A and B look a lot more similar than what you see in the first graph. The choices you make in how to display your data influence the conclusions people drew, draw from the graph. And also, choosing to not display data, or even the lack of data, you can also severely impact the story. And as data storytellers, unlike fiction storytellers, I think we have an obligation to stay close to the truth. So what are the questions that I tend to ask myself before I choose my chart? First of all, what do I want to explain? What do I want to show people? And how can a visualization help answer that question? Of course, what type of data do I have? Because different graphs require different data types. Are the viewers familiar with a certain type of graph? Will they understand what they're seeing? Simpler is mostly better. Take into consideration the ranges of the data that we're using and that we're displaying. But also think about the granularity. What do we want each mark to represent? Is it one dot per client, per day, per product? What do we want there? And last of all, something that I also have to consider, especially when I'm presenting, is space efficiency. How much space can a graph take? And am I willing to sacrifice some detail for compactness? That being said, let's move on to the next topic, which is the focus. And for this, I want to do a little exercise with you. On the next slide, I'm going to display a bunch of numbers. And I want you to, as quickly as possible, count the amount of fives that are in the image. Ready? OK, let's go. All right, how was that? You probably could find the fives. There are a bunch of them. <laughs> That's true. Uh, but it probably took you a little time as you had to sift through all of the numbers, right? So what if I would have shown you this instead? This is probably a lot easier. When a lot is happening on the screen at the same time, everything is asking for or demanding your attention. And the use of color can really help to guide your attention or draw your attention to the right thing. And it's not just color that helps with it. It's also, for instance, shapes. In this case, the eights and the ones appear in the exact same places. But it's probably easier to spot the ones because they are, their shape is more distinct from the thing that you're looking for. When we're creating data visualizations for explanatory purposes, we usually have something specific in mind that we want to talk about, that we want to communicate, uh, that we want to have a discussion about. 
And if we use the visualization that we used for exploratory purposes, we are asking the reader of that image to do all this manual work of sifting through the important information to get to what we want to talk about. There's probably too much clutter. Take, for example, this image. This is an image that, uh, of the goals scored by each country in the group stage of the 2020 European Championships. And all the data is there, but why am I showing you this, right? What do I want to talk about here? If I use a bit of color, that already helps. The red bar, in this case, draws your attention, and I probably want to say something about the goals of the Netherlands. But red isn't a great choice. Red is associated with danger, negativity, so maybe let's change it to green. Green is more gentle, more positive, but also because the other bars are blue, green isn't a great choice because it doesn't stand out as much. So an alternative would be to choose a more representative color, in this case, orange, the color associated with the Netherlands. And you can even actively draw the attention away from the other bars by giving them less noticeable colors. This is called shading. And it would also work if you have light gray versus dark gray, for instance. And we can also give our story a little bit more context. We're probably showing this in, let's say, a PowerPoint presentation and talking about it. We can also add those details and that context to the visualization itself. Uh, in this case, by adding a line and some text. In this case, a line and text that indicates the maximum number of goals in the championships in the earlier years. So it seems like, based on this visualization, that quite a few countries scored more goals than the top number of goals in the previous championship group phase. And again, we can use shading to emphasize that further with the colors. And if you compare these two images, again, very simple mantle lip images, nothing fancy going on there, um, it's, it does immediately draw your attention to the thing that I want to talk about, which gives you more time to listen to that. By changing the colors, adding some text, we've transformed the first graph, simply a lot of information, into a visualization that immediately lets you draw some conclusions. Uh, such as the Netherlands was the top scorer, and there are more high-scoring teams than in the previous championships. Of course, there are more elements than just text and lines and colors that you can add to your chart, but these are usually enough to get that first point across, and you also don't want to add too much because, again, it will clutter your chart. Uh, a note on color, though, is that you can change the colors that you're using to, for instance, match your branding of your company, do keep in mind that the default colors that were chosen by libraries like Matplotlib are usually chosen because they are very easily readable by colorblind people as well. Of course, a visualization like this is more beautiful and that does have its advantage. People just like to look at prettier pictures for a longer amount of time than they look at ugly pictures. So yes, if you can make a pretty picture out of it, that probably helps you talk about your story as well. But I would argue that it's not necessary, and also I'm not very good with Photoshop and all those kinds of things, so I just usually stick with the Matplotlib stuff. And it doesn't mean that you can't convey a good story with your data if you don't have the skill set to produce beautiful infographics. And this chart actually has another element that also helps you draw the focus, which is the title. Look at this image, for example. Again, very simple image, and it visualizes the results of a survey among students in a class that were asked whether they liked the subject or not, and it displays the percentage of students that liked it. And because the title is language's most popular, you'll probably be inclined to look at the first few subjects first, whereas if we change that title to something uh, that refers to STEM studies, then your attention is probably drawn towards the bottom few subjects. If we change the title slightly and focus on the negative, your attention will most likely go to the negative space as well. And we can, of course, combine this with the previous techniques. Again, using color to emphasize green and red in this case, and adding some context. Um, so because of some simple design choices, your attention is immediately drawn to or guided to a completely different part of the data in these two graphs. One lets you focus on how languages were popular, the other one focuses on how STEM subjects were not popular. And that brings me to my last point, forward. What is supposed to be the takeaway from your visualization? 
What is the one thing you want people to take away from your graphic? What do you, action do you want them to take? Or what discussion do you want to have with them? Because without an action, your visualization is not going to be memorable. No matter how amazing and pretty your chart is, people are going to be likely to forget it if there's nothing that they're supposed to do with that. This graph, for example, interesting insights. Um, but what are we, why are we talking about this, right? That isn't immediately clear. So people are likely to forget it. And the same for the negative one. People tend to remember negative things a little bit more, more but again, why are we talking about this? The focus is guided to the right spot, but it isn't clear why we're guiding the focus there. And a very easy way to change that is by changing the title. When we say we need to change the way we teach STEM subjects at our school, it is immediately clear why we're showing them this image. So how do we emphasize how we want to move forward, what discussion we want to have, or what action we want them to conv convince them of? First of all, put that message first as an active title. We need to change the way we offer trainings. We need to improve customer satisfaction. And on the previous slides, we need to change the way we teach STEM. Use an active title that piques their interests, and then provide the visualization as the data that supports your point. Here, it helps to guide the focus, draw attention to particular parts of the image, and that highlight the need for that message. And generally speaking, three ways to guide the attention is optimal, because you don't want to overwhelm the reader, of course, with too much information there. And lastly, emphasize, again, the action to take. Start out with the title, why are we here? Why are we talking about this? Provide the support and then talk about this. And this can be in the form of the visualization itself, such as here where we have some information extra on the image, or it can be the story that you tell along with your visualization. So the three things are active title, support the point with your visualization, and then emphasize that action or the need for that discussion again. And with that, you've converted a very simple insight uh, into an actionable one and you that you can effectively communicate. Data storytelling is the art of successfully communicating about your data, and hopefully my talk today has made that a little bit easier for you. With a good chart as a foundation for your data, titles, colors, and text to help draw the focus, and lastly, a way to present to how to move forward from that. So the foundation, the focus, and the forward. Uh, thank you for having me here today. I hope I've inspired to tell you uh, stories with your data. And my name is Marisha. Feel free to reach out. And again, we have PyData Amsterdam coming up in September, where we also have a call for proposals open. So feel free to submit that for that as well. Thank you all. We have some time for questions. So. Data can be pretty powerful for communicating things, nice hard facts, but is soft, a model is always a simplification and there are maybe things that are also important for decision making. How do you include things that people should take account of but aren't actually included without diluting your message? Um, can, you, can you give an example? Because I'm a little bit unclear of... Uh... I can't think of an explicit example, but let's say that um, the decision that you were involved involved some stuff that was quite quantifiable, but also some stuff that was um, cultural. Mm -hmm. It would be relatively difficult to include cultural in your numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, and you might say, you know, we, we think that like two thirds of this problem is in the cultural is in the quantitative domain, but you should also think of uh, you know, these cultural issues. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, yeah, I understand. So for me, it, first of all, it really matters who I'm talking to. So I use these visualizations as a way of communicating something. I'm also taking into account who I think I'm communicating with. What I usually use the visualizations and the things we talked about here for is to start the message, to, to convince people this is a conversation that we need to have, this is a discussion that we need to have. And based on that, we can get, I can present this and we can get input and we get, get this discussion. And then we can also talk about those non-quantifiable things that I couldn't include in the message. But I like to cut things up a little bit. First, convince people this is something that we need to talk about, and then talk about the details, let's say. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, thank you for the presentation. Brilliant, lovely. 
Um, I have a question. Uh, what's your opinion? Do you have any opinion about um, interactive or non-static data visualization? Either uh, that type that you can yeah. like drill on a particular type of uh, part of the data or uh, data that uh, the visualization changes in front of your eyes to focus on something. I, yeah, I think that's great for, personally, I think that's great for exploratory usage. Um, I love interactive visualizations because it lets you very easily kind of dissect your data and get some more insights and kind of connect it to previous things that you saw. But I don't necessarily like it as a way to communicate because I want to be very clear about what are we talking about. I can sometimes use a little bit more interactive visualization, but then I have a kind of a demo in mind, like I click here first and then I click to that and then you see it shift. And I won't just click around and show them a lot of data because again, you're running into that problem that we saw with that first graph where there's just too much going on and people don't know why are we here talking about this. So I, I can use interaction, but then it's a very clear guided interaction that I'm showing them. Hi, hi, Marisa. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, my question is uh, about the, uh, the, the border between storytelling mm. and mythology. And uh, for example, when, as a data scientist, we do have the uh, responsibility to report the truth and persuade our audience. Mm -hmm. Where does the border between telling the truth and persuading people to believe the opposite. And if, we, if you could provide us a comment with the potential uh, control valves in order to set the barrier mm -hmm. between truth and masking our data a lot. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very interesting point. I think me personally, I really prefer visualizations that are just the, for the exploratory purposes, right? Like the, where you can just look at all the data yourself and get as much info as you want and really form your own opinion of the conclusions that you draw from that because you have all the information there. The reason why I started focusing on this is because I was having to share a lot of visualization and data insights with people who didn't necessarily have the skill or the experience of correctly dissecting data information. And I think it's therefore, I think it's still our, um, we as data scientists have to stay as close to the truth as possible, but by not providing this guiding focus, for instance, you can also sometimes let the reader focus on the wrong thing because they simply don't have the experience of how to read the data if you don't provide that guidance yourself. So I think that as a data scientist or as a data analyst, it's on you to make sure that you provide a truthful image. I definitely don't recommend using these techniques to like skew the image to what you want to talk about or what you want to tell. I think I only use it for insights that I think are truthful to the data, but it's, it's a way of talking about the right thing and not getting diluted because you're presenting them all the information. If you give them a big Excel sheet with the data, that's also not something that you would do because then, again, they might be focused on the wrong things there that aren't relevant, that we know because we have experience dissecting that data information. Hi there. Um, thank you very much for the presentation and I think you showed how like every minute details matter in presentation. That was really great. Do you have any recommended for the readings? Yes. Um, so most of this information I based on a book called, oh, I forgot the title. I think it's just called Data Storytelling with uh, Visualization by Cole Nussbaumer. She also has some talks online on YouTube and I very thoroughly recommend those. Hi. Same question, different angles. So how do you fight your trust issues when you see someone else's visualization that's so fancy and cool and giving so clear point that you are just like, oh, that's manipulating me? Yeah, so I prefer to just see the data and see everything. But I also hope, I also hope that people who are presenting to me know that I'm the type of audience that prefers the clear picture. I am a data scientist, a machine learning engineer. So I, I should be able to understand the full picture, the box plots, all the information. And I hope they take that into account when they create a visualization gear towards me. I also take that into account when I present to other data scientists, for instance, that I present them more information than I would to, for instance, a product owner or something like that. You should have the opposite problem. I do that. I yeah. Do objectively to my opinion, and then a business person looks at it and says, that's amazing, I don't believe you, so I'm going to do my own research, and then they do crap, and they just say, it's, it's super. 
Yeah, it's, it's also that the, the techniques that I used here, like the color to guide your focus and the, the title and everything, it also means that if someone's presenting that to me, uh, I am checking out the other data that they don't want me to look at. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Hey, Marisa, uh, thank you, Will. Uh, very nice uh, presentation. Uh, quick question. Uh, I know that your focus is a lot uh, about storytelling, so it's a uh, focus in I will build this as a presentation and I will present it to somebody who I know. Uh, would you, uh, what would be your main points if you actually are doing the opposite? Oh, no, I'm building something which will be just put in a website or will be sent through a email list, that is uh, any specific point you would consider uh, if you are not present, if you will not have the chance of having this talk with the group which you mm. uh, check, or you would just take exactly the same uh, uh, path? If I am presenting to a larger group and I want to make a point, I would go through the same steps, but I would include more of the text in the story that I want to tell, maybe in, with more visualizations, maybe with more text on the images itself. So the, one of the last images I showed was actually, there was a little paragraph included in the graphic itself, so that contains the whole story there, what I wanted people to take away from it. But again, it really depends on who you're sending this to and who you intend to read this. Any more questions? Okay, cool. Uh, so let's thank Marisha again, and our next uh, speaker will start at 11.45.